Welcome to the Urban Chateau. The snow banks have finally melted, the days are getting longer and warmer, and the early flowering bulbs are just beginning to pop. And although I'm anxious to get started cleaning up the garden and getting the front porch ready for spring, the forsythia has just burst open in its blaze of glory, and I know if there's still any truth to the old saying that it'll snow three times after the forsythia blooms, I'll probably have to wait a couple of weeks before I can do that to make sure that the late frost doesn't kill off the tender shoots. The house was built in 1875, five years after the city had annexed farmland east of Parsons Avenue, or East Public Lane as it was called then, just three blocks behind the house. Monroe Avenue appeared on city maps by 1872, and many of the homes in the area wouldn't be built until like the mid-1880s or later. So my house was really one of the few standing for several years, and it's pretty modest compared to many of the other homes that would come later. Originally, there were homes across the street too, in what is now a schoolyard, but they were demolished by the early 1960s after the school was built. And unfortunately, I don't have any pictures except for a couple of their owners. The house was built by John J. Barber for $2,000. Compare that to the 21-room mansion on Broad Street that cost $90,000. It was originally Italianate in design, which you can still tell by the, the vertical profile and, and two-story angled bays. But an owner in the early 1900s did some pretty extensive remodeling and gave it more of a colonial revival look that was popular at the time, following the country's centennial by extending the front porch and adding the columns, replacing single-paned windows with mullions, building a two-story addition on the back with an attached garage, and stuccoing over the brick and the carved lentils over the windows. I haven't been able to find any early pictures of the house before 1945, but I posted a few from the 40s through the 80s and, and were recent, so you can see how it's evolved over the second half of its life anyway. There will be more about Barber and other previous owners in future episodes, but uh, just a few words about Mr. Barber that make you wonder if maybe history really does repeat itself. Not only do we share a birthday, of course, his was about 125 years before mine, <laughs> but he lived temporarily on Washington Avenue where I lived for a short while, uh, while I was buying the house. And he looks exactly like my neighbor who moved in next door a couple of years ago. Exactly. Truth can be stranger than fiction. Barber ended his own life in a lunatic asylum with a pair of scissors, though. So I'm hoping that's where the strange similarities will end. The original front porch was probably much smaller extending just to the angle of the wall here. But it's now my favorite place to be, to watch the sun rise in the east in the front, be shaded from the harsh afternoon sun in the west behind the house, and especially to sit high and dry during a summer rain shower. So before we go into the house, there are probably a few caveats I should share with you. First of all, there are many other homes in the neighborhood that are much bigger than mine. Um, there are many other homes that have had a lot more work done to them too. Uh, my house was never divided up into multifamily units, so I didn't have to go in and you know, tear out kitchens and extra bathrooms and all that. Um, but in the spirit of this project, every person's home is their castle or chateau, right? Second caveat, I'm typically the kind of person who thinks that they can do something on their own, um, but usually end up paying a contractor twice as much to go in and tear out and fix what I've done as it would have cost me to just pay them to at the start of the project. I guess my philosophy is it's easier to write a check than it is to swing a hammer sometimes. So I, I, I don't pretend to know everything. Um, I will be sharing links and resources, more information about things that I'm, tools that I'm using or you know, material. Um, but if you have any ideas, any suggestions at all, or have tried something differently and it worked for you, please feel free to share them with me. You know, 
in a comment here, send me a note on Facebook, um, whatever. I am wide open for ideas. So I appreciate your help on this and uh, we'll see where we go from here. Thank you for taking a leap of faith with me on this project. It's good to have you along. One thing I wanted to show you before we go inside is this little sign by the front door here. It's obviously typed in some kind of an old-fashioned typewriter, uh, maybe from the 1950s or so. It reads, Postal Carrier, please leave mail at side door. Thank you. My mail slot is actually in the side door that goes to the basement just off the kitchen, so it's handy for me to pick up the mail there um, so I don't have to come outside to get it. But I don't know. This just kind of seems like a nice urban touch to me. That, let's go inside for a virtual tour. In future episodes, we're going to be working on projects in literally every room of the house. This will give you an idea of the layout and some of the features of the house to start with. This is the foyer, the chandelier. There are five chandeliers in the house, uh, five fireplaces, four sets of French doors, and a set of working pocket doors that I'll show you. Another feature in here is the crown molding, which is real thick, real heavy. Um, the top two layers there are against the ceiling, the top two rows are plaster, and the rest below that is wood. Another feature that I love about the entrance here is the curved wall here for a little touch of drama that I've accented with the color paint. And the push button light switches. I love these too. They aren't in every room of the house, but they are in several. So one of the projects that I want to do is to go through and replace all of the newer flip style light switches with the old fashioned push button kind. This is the front parlor. I should probably mention that the house is haunted, not by John J. Barber, but by Mabel Fisher, who lived here back in the 1930s and 40s. If we're very, very quiet, we might get to meet her in a future episode. I'll uh, try to point out a, an item or two that might be of interest as we walk through on our virtual tour. But if you see anything that you have questions or comments about, please feel free to share them below and I'll be sure to share their story with you. Just about everything in this house does have a story behind it, so it uh, makes for a more interesting tour. And while we're in the front parlor, let me introduce you to Montparnasse. This is a, an 18th century French wood carving that I actually picked up in Savannah not long after I'd been in a local production of Les Miserables, and Montparnasse was one of the characters that I played. The real-life Montparnasse was a Bohemian artist, artist muse, and cabaret performer in the left bank quarter where she lived. But the character in the show was a low-life dandy who was part of Tonardier's gang of thugs. This guy's kind of like a Venus de Milo with his broken arm, which probably held a walking stick at one point. But I love the detail of his facial features and his fancy clothes like what I imagine my character would have worn. He's one of my very favorite pieces. Au revoir, Montparnasse. Walking through the working set of pocket doors into the middle parlor, you can see pictures of what this room looked like at Christmas in the 1950s uh, on the Urban Chateau's companion Facebook page. Here are pictures of my little pocket of France on the mantel. And the oil painting on the wall behind us over here is one of two that I have by an artist by the name of Nicolopoulos. He typically does architectural themes and he says that he likes to paint old houses and capture the spirit of the people who've lived in them. With galleries in New Orleans and Boston, most of his work are images of like the shotgun houses in the French Quarter um, or the homes in the Back Bay area of Boston. But this is actually a French chateau. It may not look like what you would typically think of as a chateau, but it is. It's a, it's a working vineyard chateau. 
And it's the reason that led me to buying my place in France. Yeah, there's a story there for another future episode. And walking through the first set of French doors into the dining room, this is the room that I've probably done the most work with so far, including using a, a padded fabric on the walls and painting the ceiling a dramatic bold green just to bring the height down a bit visually and kind of make the room feel a little bit red a bit for dinner parties. I've also replaced the solid panel wood upper cabinet doors with lead pane glass to display the antique china and glassware and to repeat the look of the uh, other set of French doors that have lead pane glass in them too. And replace the ceiling medallion with a new plaster medallion with a fruit and vegetable motif that I thought would be appropriate for the dining room. And of course seeing some for Scythia for spring, although it looks like it might be about spent by now that it's starting to bloom outside. I've always loved the south-facing bank of four windows in this room that lets in so much great natural light. I've never really wanted to cover the map and hide the light, so I've used some decorative wreaths for a bit of privacy. Heading up the main stairway, the fiber art that's on the wall on the landing was created by a friend of mine who lives just down the street on South Monroe, Gail Larned. Gail is one of the truly most beautiful people I know. She is so accomplished, a multi-talented artist, yoga instructor, um, and I hope to introduce you to her and her husband, Eric Barlow, at some point during this series. The house is surrounded by flowers outside, so when I was thinking of something dramatic to do with the landing, I thought, why not bring the flower theme inside as well? The upstairs hallway is kind of my toulouse lautrec gallery, like this one from his circus series. But this one is actually an original sketch that he did at the Moulin Rouge. Looks like it might be from a production of Lisa Strada. And there are others further down the hall. This is my bedroom and master bathroom. This is where Mama the Cat usually likes to lie in the sun on the bed. <laughs> she follows the sunspots around during the day. And this is where my best buddy Bean, my little Chihuahua, who passed away just a few years ago, still stays near me on the mantle. There's some pieces by Dali and some more Toulouse Trek in here, and a couple of Picasso. The middle bedroom is kind of a family museum of sorts. It's where I keep a lot of historic family records and photographs. The bed that I've had since uh, I was a kid is an antique sleigh bed. Quilts made by my paternal grandmother. 
and mom's favorite Victorian mama and papa chairs. <laughs> Some family photographs. And even the first piece of furniture that my paternal grandparents had when they were first married in 1896, the washstand there. This is the only room that I haven't really done anything to yet, but I'd like to start by refinishing the fireplace mantle, since all of the other fireplaces have some kind of unique, interesting faux finish or hand-painted tile. I'm curious what might be under the white paint in here. And this is the old mantel clock that used to sit on the fireplace mantel in my grandparents' front room. I can remember as a child sitting in front of the fire, listening to the drone of familiar voices, sharing stories that they've told hundreds of times before, and falling asleep. The walk-in hall closet was the original bathroom. You can see where the water lines were cut off and capped in one of the walls. And the main bath, here at the end of the hall, still has all of its original fixtures, except for the toilet. The bath, the sink, the subway tile and the walls and the floor tile all are all original to around 1910 when the owner did some pretty extensive remodeling. When I stripped the wallpaper in here, I found that the contractor who had done the work signed and dated it like an artist in one corner. I wish I could have saved it somehow, but at least it's still there under the paint. And just around the corner from the main bath at the end of the hall is the office. And the oil painting that I have on the wall just here is the only piece that I have by John J. Barber, the man who built the house. And I'm going to do what I can to make sure that painting stays with the house in perpetuity. But my two most valuable pieces of art are here on the wall above the desk, created by my grandchildren, Charlie and Lauren. And through another set of French doors into the media room. This room was part of the two-story addition that was built around 1910 and was originally a sleeping porch. In fact, you can still see evidence on the outside of the house where there was another set of windows on either side of the south windows here. A double set on either side of the west-facing windows. And even a set of windows behind the armoire. The furniture in this room is mostly mission style by Stickley. It was popular around the time that the addition was built. We have several pieces by Thomas Hart Bentonton, some Frederick Remington, and this is the other piece by Michaelopoulos, the artist I mentioned in the middle parlor that uh, gave me the idea to buy my house in France. This one's more typical of his work. It's a shotgun house in the uh, French Quarter of New Orleans. The back stairway wasn't added until the 1950s when the family wanted to give their daughter and her friends easier access to the party room upstairs above the kitchen. And these walls, by the way, are solid brick. This wall was the original exterior back of the house. And for that matter, though, all of the interior walls are at least six inch thick brick. Some 18th century French botanical prints near the back door here. And this area is gonna be one of my biggest projects that I hope you'll follow me on. The plan is, and the city has approved it, first of all, to tear out this 
wall between the kitchen and the stairway and open up the stairway about three feet to about the far edge of the sunflower picture there just so that it doesn't feel so enclosed. Raise the ceiling in the back foyer up to its original 14 foot height. Bump out the kitchen by four feet so that there's room for an actual fitted island. And tear off the attached garage and rebuild a garden room in the same footprint, which would mean bumping through this wall, opening that up, and creating an open space back here so it would be more like a great room. And the garden room will have a, a cathedral ceiling and a windowed cupola on top of it. And through the final set of French doors to the patio in the backyard. The nice view of the Columbus skyline close by. And the lilacs are just beginning to bud.